you can fiddle around with it. All right. Let's see. Ah, I'll just leave it like that. So, hey everybody, my name is Joe Mayo, and I'm here to talk to you guys about bringing low-cost Bitcoin cold storage to the world. First, I'd like to give you a little background, tell you about myself and how I got to this point. So, I'm an engineer, hardware guy, Bitcoiner, and the first time I ever came to El Salvador was prior to the Bitcoin law. I wanted to come see how Bitcoin was spent basically on the ground, and I wanted to see before and after. The second time I came was for the Adapting Bitcoin conference. It was my first Bitcoin conference ever, and as I sat in the audience, never in a million years would I have thought that next year I would be up here talking to you guys. And that's for two reasons. One, I'm not a big fan of public speaking. But second, as a hardware guy, I didn't think I would ever get the chance to work on a Bitcoin project. But if we fast forward to today, I'm currently working with two Bitcoin projects. The one that's relevant to my talk here today is SeedSigner. So SeedSigner is an open source, build it yourself hardware wallet, signing device. And I'm really thankful to the SeedSigner team for letting me be part of the project. It's inspired me to think more about Bitcoin and how we can bring Bitcoin to the world. So thinking about this, I think one of the most important questions we can ask is, how do we bring low cost cold storage and make it available to everybody in the world? But before we get to defining the problem, I want to tell you a little bit about how I think about it. So along those lines, the current Bitcoin hardware wallets that are available on the market. So, anybody see that? So basically, the current hardware wallets and signing devices were ranging from you know, about $250 down to $50 for Jade, and most of them fall in the middle. Uh, seed signers has varies because it's a build-it-yourself device. Depends if you can find the parts, how much it costs to get it in your country. So why am I pointing this out? Well, the next slide tells you a little bit about some of the after-tax wages in the countries of uh, the area, in the areas that I want to focus for low-cost cold storage. It's where we can make the biggest difference in the world. So if you look at places like Mexico, you're looking at 560, El Salvador, roughly $500, down to places like Nigeria, where it's $175. This is after-tax income for a per person. So this could be per family, too. So when I think about this, for places like El Salvador, are we really asking people to spend between 10 and 50% of their monthly income to get a single hardware signing device? In places like Nigeria, you know, 30 to 140% of your monthly income? If that's the cost to encourage people to self-custody their Bitcoin, I just think that's too high for us to reasonably expect people to, to pay this. Um, the next slide I want to bring up is a slide that helps me you know, kind of visualize where in the world low-cost cold storage can really make a difference in people's lives. So what I have here is a slide showing population density along with GDP per capita and also the location of known Bitcoin nodes. And what I gather from you know, looking at this information is, well, one, we know a lot of people in Nigeria use Bitcoin. It's one of the most adopted countries. But you see there's not a lot of nodes there. So for me, I just kind of assume that basically, yes, they're using a lot of Bitcoin, but they're probably doing it in a custodial way. And they're not you know, adapting the self-sovereign Bitcoin cold storage that we really want to see. So I look at this, and it shows me a slide where there's a lot of people that have low income, and there's low self-sovereign Bitcoin use. So to me, this is the area in the world that we most benefit from low-cost self-custody cold storage. So now that we've seen you know, where in the world this problem is, or the, the area it affects people most, we can kind of you know, clearly define it. So I kind of break it down in two parts. The first part is it's expensive. You know, the currently available hardware solutions are costly by the standards of most of the world. So if we want people to adopt Bitcoin in a self-sovereign way, we've got to lower the cost. The second portion is that most Bitcoin hardware wallets they're not really mobile friendly. And to me, the next billion people to onboard to Bitcoin are gonna do so through their phones, not through laptops or desktops. And what do I mean by really mobile compatible? To me, to be mobile compatible, 
I really would like to see an air-gapped QR code exchange of PSBTs. So you have a device and you're able to use the QR codes in the camera to exchange information with the hardware signing device that allows you to sign your transactions and have cold storage directly from the phone. I also think that the QR code model is better for uh, just adoption in general because, you know, post-COVID, most people are familiar with scanning a QR code, bringing it in their phone, and also, you know, posting stuff online. So I, I just think about my mom. You know, she's 72 years old. She can scan a QR code and she can post a picture to Facebook. So to me, that tells me she can use an air-gapped cold storage device like Seed Signer to self-custody or Bitcoin. The other concept that I think that really helps define this problem is, you know, hot cold storage from the same device. So I think of El Salvador. I come here, I don't know what you guys, but I've been handing out, you know, mobile wallets left and right to all the, the cab drivers, even Chivo, Bitcoin Beach Wallet. People here interact with Bitcoin mobile first. If we want them to do that, so, you know, they get a hot wallet, they get some sats, they get tipped from, you know, Bitcoiners attending adopting Bitcoin. But as time goes by, they're going to accrue more and more value in sats on their mobile device. As this value increases, it becomes a security risk. So how do we encourage people to, you know, transition from a self-custody or, you know, to a self-custody model? So to me, it's the ability to have both hot and cold storage from the same device that you can sign with an offline device so you're not going to compromise your private keys. So now that we've defined the problem, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the solution as I see it. So as I mentioned before, I currently work for a project Seed Signer. And what Seed Signer is, it's a build-it-yourself. It's currently a build-it-yourself stateless signing device. So what does that mean? A stateless signing device is a device where the keys are not permanently stored in memory. So if you remove power, the keys are cleared. Uh, as such, it, with the Seed Signer, you can also use the uh, QR code representation of your keys, so it makes it easier to scan in. So you may ask, you know, if the devices are removed, how do I get them back in? I don't really want to type 12 or 24 words each time. So you can use the nice QR code design to easily scan in your seeds. This also makes multi-sig really easy, but that's t topic for a different talk. So one of the reasons I think Seed Signer is key to solving the problem of bringing low-cost cold storage into the world is the fact that it is stateless. And as a stateless device, to me, it really makes sense for places like Central America and El Salvador in particular, where you have extended families living in the same houses. So with a stateless device, you can kind of use it amongst a group of friends or an extended family. For me, I trust my mom, I trust my dad, I trust my grandma. If I had a stateless signing device, I'd have no problem letting them use it to sign their transactions, and I might even help them do so. So to me, there's no longer a need for having a one-to-one -one cold storage wallet to per person, right? You can kind of spread it out. So that can greatly lower the cost. Um, to give you a little more example of what Seed Signer is, uh, currently it's a Pi Zero, a WaveShare hat, uh, a Pi camera, and an SD card. So all the code runs off the SD card. So if you really wanted to, you could have share the device and you keep your own memory card and that's how you protect your code so that no one puts malicious code on your device. So now you may be asking yourself, well, Seed Signer is so great, it sounds like a perfect solution to this problem. Well, post COVID-19, there are supply chain disruptions with the Raspberry Pis. Uh, they've gotten much more expensive if you can even find them. So the Seed Signer project has realized that, you know, we need to be more in control of our supply chains. So as such, we've kind of taken an ambitious project to design our own hardware so that we can control the supply chains and hopefully at the same cost, same time, lower the cost of cold storage. So <laughs> moving on to our custom hardware, what are the goals for the project? So our first goal is, again, number one, lower cost as much as possible. And this is where I come in as a hardware guy. This is my main contribution to the project. I'm designing the new circuit board. 
as I choose components for this device, I try to ask myself, does each component provide enough value to the user to justify the cost? You know, do we really need to put this on or is this just additional capacity? So goal number one, lower cost as much as possible. Goal number two, improve the supply. So, you know, Seed Signer is an amazing solution. We get requests all the time. We can't fulfill them. There's just not enough Raspberry Pi Zeros around. So, in the design process, one of my main goals is to make it as available as possible. So, in choosing parts, what I'm trying to do is choose parts that are the most widely available, but also parts that have similar footprints so that if we have a supply chain disruption in one manufacturer, I can easily substitute another part in that has the same footprint and not have to do a full redesign of the board. Goal number three, maintain compatibility. So the current seed signer users are the core of the project. They're the only reason we're here today. And we want to be able to support them without having to require them to upgrade. Kind of the same Bitcoin ethos, you know. If you're in a coma for five years, you should be able to come out, use your hardware as the same as when you went in. So to do that, we want to develop, the goal is to develop a common code base. So you could take your SD card from one seed signer, hopefully to the new custom signer, and it should detect what hardware it's running on and give the user a seamless experience. But along those lines, the current seed signer is completely build it yourself. And one of the greatest things about seed signer is that you can go out, you can source seemingly innocuous pr products from off the shelf suppliers and assemble it into a Bitcoin signing device with any, without anybody really knowing what you're doing and why. And this makes seed signer a perfect fit for people with all different kinds of threat models. So goal number four, open source hardware and software. So SeedSigner has always been an open source project and we want to maintain that going through for the new design. So we plan to open source the hardware and the software. We want to make it or keep it as the DIY hackable option it is now. So take the project, add features, propose new features, do whatever you want with it. Take it, change it, that's great. But we also realized that you know, most of the requests we get are for fully assembled units. So I think you know, 70, 80% of people just want to buy it off the shelf and use it as is. They only have to burn their own SD card. So the goal for the new project is to you know, maintain that build it yourself attitude, but also give people a buy it now option. So they can just go get one and be off to the races of you know, cold storage without too much difficulty. And the fifth goal is the one that I think is one of the biggest impacts is increase compatibility with mobile wallets. So, as I said before, I think the next generation of Bitcoiners is going to interact with Bitcoin in a mobile first method. You know, just like people in developing countries skipped over landlines and went right to cell phones, I think the next generation of Bitcoiners is going to interact with Bitcoin in a mobile first method. So currently Seed Signer does work with Blue Wallet. That's our mobile wallet. And I believe Nunchuck too, right? Blue Wallet and Nunchuck. And Nunchuck. So we have that compatibility, but we want to increase it. So we're currently working with the Galois and Bitcoin Beach Wallet team to enable a cold storage vault directly from the Bitcoin Beach Wallet. So that could open up cold storage directly to you know, thousands of Salvadorians who currently use the Bitcoin Beach Wallet. And to me, the great thing about that is we're taking a custodial solution and adding a self-sovereign option on top of that. So, you know, you have your checking account, now you're going to have your savings account as well. That can't be frozen, can't be stopped. Uh, the next slide is my contributions to the project. This is my proposal for the new custom board. Uh, definitely not perfect, definitely going to go through a couple of revisions, but I just want to throw it out there and show everybody. So. My goal or my desire is that we're not the only team working on this. You know, as Bitcoiners, if we really want to bring Bitcoin to the next billion people, we're going to have to work to lower the cost of cold storage and make it compatible with mobile devices. To me, this project is too important not to work on. And you know, one of the reasons that I'm here is, as I sat here last year, I thought to myself, I can't sit around and wait for other people to change the world. If I want the world to change, I'm gonna have to get out there and do it myself. So I encourage all of you to help us create the next generation of cold storage for people. So along those lines, if you wanna to contribute to the project, we're always open to new contributors. You can reach out to us at seedsigner.com, 
We have Twitter, Telegram groups, and you can come up and talk to us after the talk. And you know, we, we're looking for people with all different kinds of skill sets, hardware, software, whatever you do, there's a place for you on the Seed Sign RMT. Thanks, guys. Any questions? I think it's kind of like the first chart I showed. Where do you live? You know, somebody in Nigeria might want to cold store something that you know people in America wouldn't bother with. It really depends on. There's like a minimum cost, like asking. I think yeah. I think that really just it, it depends on your your personal experience. Okay, maybe another way of asking is how much do you think the, the bottom? Well. I, I would hope to see places like maybe my idea, and I don't know if this is actually going to come, it depends on people's threat models, but places like Hope House where they do a lot of Bitcoin education, there's the option to you know, have a seed signer there and basically give people their SD card and their QR codes and say, hey, when you need to sign a transaction, you can come here. If you trust me enough to help you with your transaction, then you probably trust me enough that I hand you a signer, it's not compromised. So at that point, you could lower it down to the cost of an SD card, really, if you know, people are willing to volunteer the hardware for you know, a trusted third party. Like for instance, I do a lot of Bitcoin outreach. I start Bitcoin meetups. And a lot of people come in and say, help me self-custody my Bitcoin. And they hand you their private keys. And you're like, I don't want your private keys. Don't show it to me. But they, you know, they continue to hand it to me. So I think there is an opportunity to at least get people on board. And maybe as they accrue more and more, then they're like, okay, I've been using somebody else's seed signer or, you know, somebody else's jade. Maybe it's time for me to invest, one, buy one for my family. I mean, we could make layaway programs too. I mean, that, that could help. So let's, let's assume some, some guy has uh, really succeeded in making a transaction. You can see the sending address, the receiving address, the change address, the amount. I mean, basically, you can verify all aspects of the, the, yeah, you can see it. And that's where I do appreciate NFC. I do think it has a place. I mean, I, for me, the more options Bitcoiners have, the better off we're going to be. So I encourage people to do that. But for me, I like to see it. So that's what drew me to seed signer is I can verify every single step of the transaction. Since the seed signer never touches the internet, you'd kind of have to have both your seed signer compromised and the coordinator compromised at the same time, which you know, since you can choose your coordinator, it's really tough to, to, not impossible, but it is tough to compromise everybody at the same time. How would you compromise I haven't really thought about that, but uh, Keith wrote the software. I'm the hardware guy, so he's probably a better uh, person to ask about that. You have six minutes, uh, but also when is the uh, hardware going to be ready? When you finish the software. <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn it over to Seed Hammer. I told him he could speak for a little bit, so I'm going to let him go. Thank yeah, so um, Joe allowed me a few minutes to present a uh, project we're working on. It's very new. We just opened for pre-orders. It's called Seed Hammer. And uh, whereas Seed Signer is a signing uh, device for, well, signing Bitcoin transactions, the Seed Hammer is a device that can engrave your seed material on, on, steel, uh, on steel plates. I don't have a machine with me, but it's still, it's quite bulky, at least the version we have right now. It's 15 kilos and about this big, but you can see a video of it here. It doesn't have audio on it, but you may be able to uh, see that the video bobbles a little bit at when the machine start hammering. And that's because the, the, the functionality of it is engraving by using a very hard needle that that's, um, stamps the metal plate many times a second. And that, those stamping um, comprise the shapes you see on the metal plate. And as you saw in the video, there is two devices. There's the engraving device itself, and there's the controlling device, which is something you can use uh, yourself. Play again. Sorry? Play it again. Play it again. Um, so this, in this case, it's an Android phone. You can, use, you can use almost any device, and the and the machine is in the background. And what comes out of this process are plates like this. 
Um, in this configuration, it's about a credit card size. You can see it afterwards. And it contains the seed words themselves, of course, the BIP39 seed words, seed words. It also contains a CQR code that is scannable by the seed signer, which is, to us, pretty impressive. And on the back side, for multi-signature setups, it has the XPUBs. And why does it need the XPUBs? That's because if you have, a, for example, a two out of three setup, you don't just need the two plates out of three. You need the, th the third plate's public information. It's XPUB. And we, we solve that and make these plates uh, completely uh, self-contained by putting the XPUB of the next plate on the backside of a plate. So if you have three plates and uh, the, uh, for plate number one, the backside will contain the XPUB and its QR code for plate number two, and plate number two will contain the uh, XPUB for plate number three, and the same for plate uh, three and one, which means that wh uh, whichever two plates you pick out of this three-plate uh, three setup, you will have the seed words required for spending your funds, and you will also have on one of the two plates the XPUB of the third plate. So you can throw everything else away, uh, every other data about your wallet, except for the three plates, of course, and still be able to retain, um, your, uh, exit your funds. Um, so that was the hardware. I'm just going to quickly show you the software as well. This is, so this usually runs on, for example, an old Android phone. If you have a seat signer, it can run on the Raspberry Pi Zero and the Raspberry Pi Zero 2 for complete air gapness. And, uh, and the device, of, of course, communicates through USB with the engraver. So the front page, you select the setup, either single signature, uh, two out of three, or a three out of five. The three out of five plates are a little larger, uh, whereas the single sig and, and uh, two out of three can fit on this credit card size plate. And then you fill out the words. You can either use Diceware, um, where you use a set of five dice to make the words, to, uh, to make up the random words that, that you need for the plate. Or if you have an existing seat, you can just use the keyboard and uh, enter the seat to, uh, through this uh, interface. You can also, if you really want to, you can insist on getting the app to fill out the place for you. But then you are trusting our uh, implementation of the, our random implementation. Uh, but we'll do it here for, present for, for uh, the presentation. You give it a title that also ends up on the plate, and then you're just more or less presented with a print dialog where you can select the plate to print or engrave or just continue on with the, with the one you, you're, you're at. You're directed to set up the plate uh, on the machine, uh, adjust the needle distance and so on, and after that, the app will start just communicate with the engraver and start engraving the, the plate on the, on the first side. Then you're asked to confirm that the plate actually contains what you expect, and then it's off to the second, the back side with the XPUB. And that's about it. Um, we're still pretty early in the project. We have, we just have this, the, the Twitter page. That's what I, uh, why I showed you that. We are still working on the website. But we are just a few hours ago open for pre-orders, uh, so it's non-binding. But we'd uh, appreciate it if you DM'd us and told us if you want, you would be interested in a machine like this. And otherwise, I think maybe there's a minute or two for questions. Otherwise, I'm done. What's the price? It's 4.50 before shipping. And you want to see the plate? You can pass it around. Any other questions? Uh, not the machine. We only have one machine. We call it the Swiss cheese machine because it's full of holes. For it. That's the prototype. He's working on it. He's here to call. But the first order will go to, will go to me. So I'll, I'll, I'll be the one to see an actual seat, uh, seat hammer. And it will be here in El Salvador? It will be here in El Salvador, yes. So when can we expect the first order? Like the order now? So we have everything ready. We have a manufacturer in China. It's actually a, 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 a a standard machine that we modified for our use, so it can be sent now if we wanted to. So what we're working is on is the material, the the, um, the packaging, the the manual, and so on. So I would say within a, within this year at least, maybe even within a month or so. Yes. Have you stress tested the plates at all? Or seen something that you 
down to Jameson Lock, for example? We hope to do that, but we are, it, basically we're using the same kind of uh, stainless steel that all the other um, handmade steel solutions do, so we don't expect there to be problems. And it does engrave, you can tell from the plate, it does engrave uh, rather deeply into uh, the plate, so I don't think there will be problems. But no, we haven't done the lob test yet. <laughs> Thank you. You read?